Hi, I'm Eileen Martin. I'm an assistant professor in the math department and program for computational modeling and data analytics at Virginia Tech. I'm also a co-ambassador for WIDS Blacksburg at Virginia Tech. And today, this workshop is gonna be on why we love arrays for data science. In fact, we're really gonna look at what are some basic models of our computer memory architecture that we can take advantage of when we're designing data structures and algorithms so that we can get really fast performance by cutting down on the amount of data that we need to move around in the computer. And a lot of this data is moving around behind the scenes. So we need to be able to sort of have these basic models to predict how it'll move so that then we can design better algorithms. Originally, I saw this in the context of numerical linear algebra, and then later in the context of partial differential equation simulations. And those are very traditional kind of high performance computing and computational science and engineering topics. But in fact, these same lessons really carry over to be even more important in data science. The reason for that is that our number of floating point operations, things like additions and multiplications that we do relative to the amount of data that we actually are working with and the amount of data that we have to move, tends to be relatively low in a lot of data science applications. In data science, we have a variety of different goals that might make us want to have efficient code. We might want to reduce our turnaround time to get some final result. We might want to reduce the wait time for users of interactive workflows or for developing a workflow and need to run it many times in different with different settings. We might want to reduce that wait time as well for ourselves. We might be working with data in a streaming context, maybe to process in real time. Perhaps your organization wants to reduce your energy bills to run your cluster. Or if you're working with cloud computing resources, you might be trying to reduce your cloud computing bills. We might also want to analyze larger data sets using our existing computing resources without having to invest in more hardware. Or we may want to be running larger model ensembles with those same resources. Similarly, if we look at high performance computing for computational science and engineering applications, we actually have very similar goals for improving our efficiency. We wanna reduce our turnaround time, wait time for users of interactive workflows. We might have streaming data or data that's being created through simulations that we need to work with as it's created. Maybe trying to reduce energy bills for our clusters as is a concern at many of the large uh, national labs, for instance, in the US. Um, we might be trying to analyze larger data sets or simulate larger problems or over a larger region with the same compute resources. And in cs &E, instead of looking just at larger model ensembles, we might also be looking at things like uncertainty quantification or inverse problems, but similar goals there. Additionally, there might be things like supercomputing benchmark rankings that are, are motivating some of our goals and efficiency in that space. So it's really natural for us to actually look at CSME for some tips on how to improve efficiency in data science applications, even though we oftentimes think about them as quite different. Today, I'm going to show you some tips and tricks that I learned in the context of partial differential equation simulations and trying to improve their efficiency, but have actually really served me well as I've worked with large streaming seismic data sets for geophysics applications. So these same tips and tricks work for data science just as they do in computational science and engineering, especially when we have high throughput data. In my own research, which focuses on computational science and data science for geoscience applications, I really care about efficiency because I work a lot with seismic data that comes from new types of sensors that are acquiring a lot more seismic data than we've ever had before. Like several orders of magnitude more data. So on the left, you can see a summary of a couple dozen different experiments that were collected with new types of seismic sensors called fiber optic distributed acoustic sensing, which I work with a lot. Just to see how much data is being collected, um, I took each of the experiments and, and my collaborator, Nate Lindsay and I plotted what was the start and end date of each of the experiments and how many floating point values per second were they acquiring? So a lot of these are somewhere around a million floating points per second, 
or 10 million floating point values per second. And they varied on how long they took, whether it was just a fraction of a day or even several years, like the Stanford DAS array, which um, I had started up with Biondo Biondi in 2016. So if we're maybe not thinking so much about just what is the number of floating point values per second that we store, but what are these sort of like cumulative data quantities? Let's grab uh, just a handful of nine experiments, um, some that are low rates, some that are high rates, and look at how much they acquired. So on the right, you see cumulatively over just a few years, uh, these nine experiments uh, collected about 800 terabytes of data. And okay, that's not insane if you're like working at a large tech company or um, something like that. But when we're starting to think about wanting to have public uh, scientific data archives, this 800 terabytes from nine experiments over just a few years totals up to about as much as all of the US's public seismology archives over the last several decades. A lot of what I'm working on is sort of how do we make our analyses of these data faster and can we store them in any sort of compressed form so that we can work with them more efficiently and actually make them public in the future. The takeaway messages from all of this is basically data movement is really slow and energy inefficient when compared to floating point calculations. But if we understand some basic architecture principles this can help us guide our algorithm design so that we can have better performance. Computer memory is organized into larger, slower to access regions, as well as smaller, faster to access regions. And we can actually take advantage of this in how we break up our problems. Also, our data are moved in small, fixed size chunks. By understanding these, we can actually start to look at why arrays are such a nice data structure if we're able to take advantage of them, particularly because they enable regular read and write patterns, which means that we're able to use more data when it's in fast to access memory. And we can take advantage of hardware features that allow us to have data shuffled between levels before we actually need them. So I've used this term array a few times now. Let's define this. When I'm talking about an array, I'm thinking about a series of numerical values that are all the same type and they're contiguous in memory. Of course, you can define other types of arrays where you might have mixes of different data types, maybe a mix of ints and floating point values or strings. But in its simplest form that we're going to look at it today, we're just going to think about maybe a sequence of a bunch of floats, single precision data. So each one of these values within my array, which I've referred to here as ARR, uh, each of them is going to be indexed by an integer. And if I have n entries, I'm going to start with 0 here. Each of those entries is going to have four bytes. And I know that the memory address of the next entry of my array is going to be exactly four bytes after the memory address of the previous entry of the array. I'm going to show you that data movement is expensive and slow. So let's do a simple experiment to tell that this is the case. So let's say that I were to loop through a for loop in times. And I just have four values. I'm going to keep using those same four variables for every one of these loops. I'm going to have z, a, x, and y. They're each just a floating point value. And I'm just going to do z equals a times x plus y. And I'm going to do it in times. OK, it's a little redundant to do this. But what we're going to see here is just what is the effect of accessing those same four values in times, and then also the effect of doing one read three or one write, three reads, and um, one multiplication and one add for each one of those iterations. And then we're going to do a similar experiment where we're actually going to have some 1D arrays. And I'm going to loop through n times. And I'm going to have z that's a vector now with n entries, a that's a scalar, just one value, x that's a vector, and y that's a vector. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to say the ith entry of z equals a times the ith entry of x plus the ith entry of y. And I'm going to do this for every entry in that vector. And in this way, we can see that we've got basically the same number of floating point operations that are happening in each of these two examples. But this example on the left with the repeats is just going to deal with three values that are read and one value that's written. While the example on the right, where we're going to work, through, work our way through an entire vector, 
that's going to be one plus two in read values and in write values. We're going to do this just with simple 1D arrays in C. And um, I'm going to do some timing on this. So I ran this um, for in values between 100 and 52 million. So a wide range of, of different scales of problems. Over here on the right, I've plotted the average time per run. So that would be to go through the entire 1D array or all in loops of the repeat example for both the vector example where we have different data in bright green or the repeat example in dark green. And we see that, okay, at least for the largest size problems where we're working more at the scale of about 50 million, we've got about a factor of five difference in how long that takes. So we're seeing that working our way through a whole vector and accessing a lot of different data is a lot more expensive than just doing the floating point operations. Okay, but from this visual, it's a little hard to see how, how different are those? What's that growth rate and what's the scalability of these kinds of operations? So let's change up our visualization just a little bit. Now we're looking at the same visual on just a log log scale. And what this allows us to do is see if we have a linear looking pattern here, that means that we've got sort of a constant growth rate um, as we say quadruple our problem size. We want to also, if it's um, growing at just a linear rate, that's going to look like a line here with a slope of one if we're also just quadrupling our time. But of course, we see that our slope deviates from one from some, for some of these uh, problem sizes. So especially look at our light green line here. We've got a higher slope than one. And in fact, we're uh, growing quite a bit faster than our problem size is growing. So our problem is slowing down as we get larger when we're working with this vector of data. So how do we understand why it's at this problem size that we start to get some kind of jump? That is, what's happening around one to three million entries here when I'm running this on this particular machine? In addition to data movement being slow, it's also really energy inefficient. So kind of motivating this, um, but not getting into too many of the details of really showing this through what you're actually measuring it. Um, let's just take a look at this pretty influential paper from 2007 by Fang and Cameron, uh, which kind of started the green 500 list, really looking at high performance computing clusters, especially for computational science and engineering applications. They're looking at how much performance are we getting versus how this is growing over time. And also, what is the amount of energy that has to be used to actually run this for different supercomputing clusters? So we're getting, at that point, close to the scale of like a, a small power plant. And of course, by today, these predictions would be much, much higher even. So in fact, over the past decade or more, um, a big part of the effort in trying to do large-scale high-performance computing clusters has really been on improving that energy efficiency and reducing energy usage per gigaflop of performance. Part of this has led to things like the growth of using GPU computing instead of uh, just CPU computing. In this talk, we're just going to take a look at CPU computing to get some, some basic models going. But as you're thinking about how to reduce energy usage, do consider using a GPU if it's a good fit for your problem. Over on the data science side, we're also seeing that this is starting to be a growing concern, especially in natural language processing, but really anything where you're trying to train really large networks or really large models with very large collections of data. Think about your dimensionality, think about your scalability there. I would recommend taking a look at these two papers that really focus on some of these issues of what is our energy use. Um, in natural language processing to get a better feel in that context of how this comes up. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on back to CPU land, thinking about our memory hierarchy and what was causing those jumps that were causing drops in efficiency, that is to say increases in our timing relative to our problem size. The answer lies in the basic structure of the memory hierarchy. The idea is that we have a little bit of fast access data 
but we've got quite a bit of other slower to access data and even more very slow to access data. So looking at our diagram here on the right, which is kind of not to scale at all. Um, of course, we all know that we've got our disk here where we've got all of our files stored, but that's so slow to access, we're gonna pretend it doesn't even exist for this, um, this whole tutorial workshop. Um, instead, we're just gonna be thinking about main memory and then L3 cache, L2 cache, L1 cache and registers. So main memory is sometimes also referred to as DRAM. Uh, you may have heard of that before. It's a lot slower to access data that's sitting in main memory than any of these cache levels. And you see, as you go up into these higher and higher levels of cache that are smaller and smaller, it gets faster and faster to access data that's in there, both for reads and for writes. Up at the very top, we've got our registers where we're actually doing our computations. So let's say we wanted to look at this in a little bit closer to a real scale. So for the cluster that I ran this on, which is at Virginia Tech's Advanced Research Computing Center, I looked up the processor that uh, I was running this on. It's actually a little bit more complicated than what I've drawn here because we've actually got um, basically 24 cores on a node and then there's really like 12 cores on each half of it. Um, but the basic concept of having cache and main memory is there. And so um, we've got basically 32 kilobytes of L1 cache. That's our fastest and tiniest level of cache. We've got 256 kilobytes, so about 10 times as much L2 cache. Then we've got our L3 cache that's 30 megabytes. This is actually um, off scale by a little bit here, but it was gonna be really hard to see our, our L1 and L2 cache if I, I didn't make it smaller. And then um, we've got a bunch of main memory. And here I've just pictured a small fraction of that main memory um, to give you just a sense of what the scale is like. So how are we gonna start testing like whether what we're seeing is really what caused that jump in our timings? That is, as we went through our long vector, what was it that made us slow down at a certain size problem? And how does it connect to this memory hierarchy? So we're gonna have two different test cases now. We're gonna ignore our repeating four values test case. And instead we're gonna look at our regularly ordered, what we call an axe B, basically a scalar A times a vector X plus a vector Y. We're gonna overwrite that into another vector called Z. Okay, so that we're gonna do that in a regular order where we iterate through the, each of these vectors from i equals zero down to i equals n minus one. So we just go one entry at a time, same order for all of our vectors. And then the other experiment that we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend that maybe we wanna mock up what would happen if we had kind of an irregular data structure. Maybe it's a database that's not sorted well, maybe it's um, some kind of sparse data structure, something where we're going to have to have a lot of indirection. Maybe you could even think about what if I stored a bunch of numerical values in a really long linked list, right? We'd be jumping around a lot. Okay, so to simulate these other sort of unstructured data types or, or less ordered data types, we're going to have just a randomly ordered AXP operation. Essentially, we're going to have a vector called index that's full of integers that are just the numbers 0 through n minus 1 shuffled around in a different order. So we're basically going to be accessing the same entries as our regularly ordered AXP and we'll do the same operations, but we'll just be doing it on a permuted version of these vectors. So we'll kind of jump around from one location to another, to another, to another, chosen completely at random. But all of our vectors will be going through these indices in the same order as each other. So we're doing the exact same operations, just in a different order. All right, so to start understanding which parts of our memory hierarchy we're actually going to use as we do our regularly ordered vector test, we need to calculate what should our memory footprint be? That is to say, how many bytes are we actually going to be using for each of these vectors? So for our vector z, 
we're going to have four bytes for each floating point value if we're going to assume we've got kind of a single precision decimal number for each number. And then we've got n values, so we've got four n bytes there. We've got four bytes for our a scalar value. As n gets bigger, that's so tiny that we're not even going to bother with including it in our accounting, really. Um, and then x and y are both vectors that also have n entries, so we've got 12 n bytes, roughly. All right, and then if I were to have my randomly ordered n-dimensional vector problem, I'm doing the exact same calculations except for working with this index array, which has been basically randomly shuffled to say, what order am I going to be jumping around in my vector? Okay, so this index array has got four n bytes. Z has got four n bytes. X has four n bytes. Y has four n bytes. So we're dealing with like 16 times n bytes of, uh, of values here. And again, we're going to leave off any little scalar here or there that's just a couple of bytes that doesn't grow with n. All right, so we've got formulas to say for any n, how many bytes do we expect to use? in our memory uh, hierarchy. All right, so if we, if we assume that we're gonna start kind of filling up our, our L1 cache first, um, if we were to be working with kind of smaller vectors, then we would expect that our 12 in bytes is gonna exceed that L1 cache, which for the machines I ran this test on is 32 kilobytes. That's gonna happen around in around 2600. And for a randomly ordering, pretty close, about 2,000. So somewhere in that 2,000 to 3,000 in value is where we expect to sort of be running out of space in L1 cache. And that means that we're also having to swap out values in our vectors in maybe L2 cache or L3 cache even possibly, um, certainly going outside of the L1 cache. We can similarly ask ourselves, when are we going to run out of space in both L1 and L2 cache? So now we've got 32 kilobytes plus 256 kilobytes available to us, at least on, on the machine that I ran this on. All right, so I've got 288 kilobytes and my regular ordering is going to run out around 24,000 entries and my random ordering around 18,000 entries. Now these are not exact estimates simply because um, on a multi-core machine like this, there are some, some questions about which parts of cache are shared between different cores, how are those other cores being used, et cetera. Um, we're gonna kind of gloss over that for now, just to get a big picture of what are these things that could be affecting our performance. So these are just rough estimates here. Similarly, we can look at L3 cache and see when we're gonna run out of that. More like, 2 million entries, depending on whether it's random or regular ordered. All right, so let's run our timing results. What do we see? Let's take a look. So again, we're going to look at a, a log log plot so that we can see those kind of like uh, straight lines indicating the same growth rates. Our random order access is certainly slower than our regularly ordered access. There are some little jumps here and there, maybe here, maybe here or here. Otherwise, they're mostly straight lines. Growth rate isn't changing too much. We see kind of like three different groupings of where we have these different rates. So for smaller scale problems, around 10,000 or less entries, We've got a pretty little difference between our regular and random order, but that difference grows as we get more into the range of maybe 100,000 to a million entries. And up above that, in the millions to tens of millions of entries, that difference grows even worse. Let's plot where our predictions were for where we would run out of L1, L2, L3 cache. So I've just overlaid those here. L1, we expect it to be full around two times 10 to the third. We don't really see a lot of difference in our performance there, so not much is showing up. All right, if we look over at uh, where we're gonna run out of L2 cache, that's around two times 10 to the fourth. 
And so for those kind of problems in this range, we're expecting that we're using probably our L1 and our L2 cache. Both of those are pretty small and pretty fast to access. Moving on, we expect to run out of L3 cache at around two times 10 to the six. So we see that as we start going out into using L3 cache in addition to L1 and L2, suddenly we start to get that big kind of performance hit. So we see our, uh, our random order especially slowing down a lot. Our, our regular order also slows down a little bit. But that random order is affected a lot more. And as we run out of L3 cache, we've got an even bigger gap between our random and regular order. So when we're out here um, in the sort of 10 to the seventh problem size range, out here, we're having to grab data potentially not just from L1, L2, and L3, but even going out to main memory or DRAM to grab that data. And that's much, much slower and much bigger. So we see a bit of a jump where we predicted here as we ran out of L2 cache. And we saw a bit of a jump as we ran out of L3 cache. But you might wonder to yourself, oh, is this just a coincidence? How can I actually test whether this is real? Well, we can turn to a tool like Cache Grind, which is part of Valgrind. Some of you may be familiar with the Valgrind tools on Linux for hunting down memory leaks. What it does is it simulates which parts of the memory hierarchy are being used, and it'll tell you whether you're getting L1 cache hits, meaning that you wanted to grab some data and it turned out it was already in L1, or whether you were getting L1 cache misses, which meant that you had to go check L2 and L3, or maybe even main memory. Cache grind has a downside in that it kind of lumps together L2 and L3 cache. So we just call that lower level cache in cache grind. And part of that may have to do with how um, we oftentimes have lower level cache being shared between different cores. So sometimes what is L2, what is L3 can be a little fuzzy. Um, anyways, um, if we get all the way to L3 and we still have not found the data that we need, that's called a lower level cache miss. And that means that then we have to go out to main memory to look for that data. And main memory is so much slower to access. So what Cache Grind does is it reports to us what is the proportion of times we wanted to read data or write data that it was an L1 cache hit, that it was a lower level cache hit or miss. Um, and so that we can break down how much data is coming from L1 how much is coming from L2 or L3, and how much is coming from main memory. And we can see, when are we starting to actually make these transitions out of L1 into L2 or L3, and then out of L2 and L3 into main memory. So I ran these results on my laptop, which had slightly different dimension predictions, but overall exactly the same trends. And I've plotted with these black dashed lines where were the dimensions that were predicted to have us go out of L1 and into L2 or L3, and then go out of L3 and into main memory. So we've broken this down into both reading operations and writing operations on the right side. Let's just take a look at our reading operations. So we've got a little bit of data that's coming out of our lower level, or out of cache in main memory, which are marked in blue and red. But we start to get really consistent uh, results of getting data that comes from our lower level cache after we hit this first dashed line, which was where we predicted to go out of L1 and into L2. We expected to go out of L3 at this next lower black dashed line, and that's exactly where we start to see a switch over to having more red percentage here, which indicates data coming from main memory. And this is even more um, exasperated or more pronounced of a pattern when we're working with our randomly ordered data. So with our regularly ordered data, there's just a very tiny fraction, maybe a percent or two, um, that's coming from outside of L1. 
But when we're working with our random ordering, suddenly we get a lot of data, maybe as much as 10% coming out of um, our lower level cache, which is much slower, and even quite a bit of our data coming from outside of cache in our main memory, especially for our larger size problems beyond where we expected to go outside of our cache. And that's also true when we're writing our data as well. In fact, there's an even higher percentage of data for our writes that's, um, that's coming from outside of L1. And because our data movement is so much more expensive than our floating point operations, even a small percentage, 5%, 10% of our data coming from outside of L1 can actually have a major impact on our timing performance. Okay, so we saw that we've got these jumps happening where we kind of predicted for going outside of L2 and outside of L3. But you might still be wondering, okay, I saw that there was a higher percentage of data coming from lower level cache or from main memory when I did a random order, but maybe you don't understand like why, why is that data coming from lower level cache or from lower level or from main memory? Okay, so, so why is random actually leaving us um, results that have a lot more lower level cache hits and main memory hits? Um, well, it's, it's a couple of reasons actually. First off, our data are not moved alone. When we go and try to find a piece of data in L2 or L3 or main memory, the computer doesn't just go and grab that one floating point value that you want. In fact, it grabs a whole little collection of data called a cache line. And so a whole little group of data moves together up into L1 cache for you to start using in your registers then. Additionally, there's a concept of prefetchers. Prefetchers are basically data streams which predict which data are likely to be needed next if you're following a simple data access pattern. And it's going to go ahead and grab that data while your previous data are being operated on. You can actually think about this as being a little bit of a, a pipeline parallelism kind of thing. You've got one piece of data you're working on right now, and the next piece of data is already being prepped for you. Okay, so let's look in more detail at what's going on with these cache lines. So let's say I've got an array of data sitting down in main memory here. And I want this little single value here, but it's gonna move up with a group of values. It's called a cache line that are all neighbors. So they're all gonna move up into O1 cache and then be used in the registers. So we've got these cache lines. Typically a cache line is 64 bytes. That means like eight double precision decimals or 16 single precision floating point decimals. Some computers uh, do have 32 or 128 byte um, cache lines. And so um, you would check this for your own computer when you're trying to think about how to sort of optimally work with cache lines. But at least I think one big takeaway from this is that if you move a piece of data up into a one cache, what you need to do is try to use all of the pieces of data while they're all sitting up there in L1 cache at that same time. So what are the strategies to take advantage of this? So use all your neighboring data values at the same time when it's possible. There are also libraries of what are called single instruction multiple data or SIMD vectorized operations, especially for a lot of your common linear algebra operations, these are available. When you use those, it means that your registers are actually able to operate on all of those pieces of data at the same time in the same way. So these are just for very simple types of operations, but can be really useful for, for a number of different types of analyses. Also, if you're using, say, a 2D or 3D data array, maybe for images or videos, or just tensors of data with multiple uh, attributes, um, 
One strategy you can consider doing is actually blocking up those 2D and 3D arrays if you're using some kind of 2D or 3D stencil or convolutional kernel. So for instance, if you're working with a neural network and you need to apply a 2D convolutional filter to your 2D image data, well, that means that you need to grab things from different rows of your matrix. So if you can have those pieces of data close together in memory, that can really help. So you might actually reorder your image data to not just go one line at a time, but actually to be broken up into little rectangles that you go through one at a time. And this is a trick that's also common in partial differential equation simulations, but it helps us really optimize these little blocks so that they optimally fit into our L1 or our L1 and L2 cache. The other concept that sort of helps us out with having faster performance when we have data accessed in a regular order from an array is what's called a prefetcher. So let's say we've got one chunk of data, which we had pulled up from, uh, from I don't know, let's pretend it came from main memory. So we've got one chunk of data here in black that we've already pulled up and into our uh, L1 cache and we're working with it in our registers. And let's say that we've been accessing a bunch of data from throughout this array. Well, if we're going in a really regular access pattern, then actually the computer's prefetchers can predict that the next chunk of data that we're gonna need is gonna be this next sort of cache line right here. So while the previous chunk of data is being operated on, simultaneously, the prefetcher is gonna go and grab this next chunk of data that you need. If you keep your access patterns really simple and predictable, then this is gonna help make it possible for the prefetcher to do this. You can also have multiple prefetcher streams that are simultaneously grabbing data. So if you have maybe multiple data attributes that are stored in separate arrays, well, you can have different prefetchers that are each grabbing those attributes uh, at the same time if you need to access those different attributes at once. It's possible to have multiple prefetchers, but do know that eventually there are a limited number of them. Um, so I've run into that before, um, where you do sometimes run out of prefetchers and you can kind of hit a little bit of a wall on, on your performance because of that. But most of the time, if you're just working with a few arrays, these can really help you out in having faster access of your regularly ordered data. Now, everything that I've shown you today has really been about Okay, this, this simple sort of XB operation, just taking a vector, scaling it, adding it to another vector. And that's just a very simple linear algebra operation. But in fact, the effects of this memory hierarchy, going from small and fast access cache levels to larger, slower to access levels, and even main memory, these show up all over the place in a variety of different data science operations. So. Um, for instance, if you're trying to do a matrix factorization, like working with the PCA factorization to calculate dimensionality reduction for your data set, it's very likely that you'll see some of these, um, these effects of uh, your cache and your memory hierarchy in that performance as you look at different scale data sets. So hopefully uh, this will help you kind of interpret um, what's going on in those cases. All right, let's recap what we've seen so far. We saw that data movement is really slow. I didn't show you that it's energy inefficient as well, but um, it is a major cost in that way as well. But we saw some, some basic architecture principles that can help us guide how to design our algorithms to perform better. So we saw that computer memory is organized into those kind of larger, slow to access regions and then smaller, fast to access regions in cache. We saw that data is moved into cache in fixed size chunks, and we should take advantage of those full chunks as we have them. And we saw the benefits of using arrays, especially when we're able to get more regular read and write patterns for whatever algorithm we're trying to implement. So especially the fact that we're able to use more data when it's in that fast access cache memory is really good. We're also able to take advantage of things like prefetchers, 
which try to predict which data we're going to need. And so if we're able to use these regular access patterns, then the data can be shuffled up to our fast to access regions before we actually need them. So I hope that this will help you with some basic understanding of how to interpret efficiency and scalability in your own uh, codes and um, that you can use this in designing your algorithms moving forwards. So thanks for, for joining this workshop. I hope you enjoy WIDS and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Uh -huh.